So welcome, good, mor good morning, good afternoon. I'm David Ezer, Vice President of Programs with Jewish Funders Network, and excited to have you with us for today's program on new models for Jewish media. Hopefully the first in several conversations around, around this topic. I'm pleased to see so much interest. I'm happy to introduce uh, just briefly who, who will be with us overall. We have Rabbi Elliot Cosgrove of Park Avenue Synagogue, who will who will formally start after a quick hello from from Andres uh, Our two featured speakers this after this this afternoon are Jennifer Preston of the the media uh, wing of the Knight Foundation out of out of Miami, and Peter Lotman of the Emerson Collective. And we have our journalist responses and conversation with Ami Eden from 70 Faces Media, Andy Silo Carroll of The Jewish Week, Jody Rodoran of The Forward, and hopefully Ayer Rosenberg of Tablet, who is not with us yet. And once we get started, I will see what's if we can get him. So Andres, let me throw it to you for framing and to get started. And then and away we go. Thank you, David. And thank you to all our um... Uh, great panelists today. I hope it's going to be a, a stimulating conversation. I'm just going to say that this this issue of Jewish media, uh, first of all, is a is an old obsession of, of mine and something that at JFN we've been very focused on um, in the past. Uh, we personally believe that media is critical uh, for the fabric of any society and, of course, for the fabric of the Jewish community. Um, it's critical to keep the dialogue going. Um, and is critical to sort of incentivize discussion and debate about the issues that are uh, critical for the Jewish community. Um, it's a truism already that media <clears throat> is in, I mean, I wouldn't call it crisis, it's a new normal, it's a set of challenges to its business model, to its relevance, um, part of the, you know, affected by the general assault on truth and and data and information, and um, and those issues are compounded for the Jewish community. I mean, on layered on the issues that Jewish media has, uh, that media in general has, we have the issues that Jewish media has in particular, and those were highlighted by the fact that the first organizations to close um, in this crisis, in this COVID crisis, were actually media organizations. So I think that a conversation is necessary and it's important, especially for us, for funders that can play a role in, in changing the media ecosystem and nurturing that media ecosystem. So without further ado, I wanna just, I wanna just one quick word to thank Jody from The Forward who'd been my partner in thinking many of the things and, and also my long, um, you know, our long-standing partnership with folks from JTA, and I see Ami there, and Tablet, and the Jewish Week, um, uh, that other practitioners that are in the front lines there in the trenches, and we're gonna be hearing from them. So without further ado, I, I'm gonna give the floor to Rabbi Elot Kosgrove, um, who is a dear friend and a thought leader, and can talk from his rabbinical perspective about why this conversation is important. Andre, thank you very much, and it's an honor to be here to open up the meeting with a, a rabbinic thought, but this is a uh, program, a panel, for all the reasons, Andre, that you just listed, which is very near and dear uh, to, to my heart, um, the importance of exchanging ideas um, and the role that plays in strengthening our Jewish community. Without uh, that ability, I think, um, it, it's uh, we're, we're in crisis and we, we need to be able to do so um, actively and by way of the Jewish press and Jewish media. Uh, I turn to uh, the very first communications tool of our people, uh, this week's Torah reading. Um, and I want to frame today um, by way of two scenes. Um, uh, in Parshat Be'alotcha, um, there is a fascinating moment where um, Joshua, Moses' right-hand man, sees two people, Eldad and Medad, speaking out. Um, and, uh, and Moses, uh, excuse me, Joshua reprimands them. Um, and Moses, the most interesting part about it, is that Moses then um, reprimands Joshua 
by saying, why are you so upset on my account? Would that all the Lord's peoples were prophets? Um, meaning Moses sought to create a community where um, the prophetic voice was taken up, not just by Moses, but that there would be strong, strident, empowered, impassioned voices there and then um, amongst Israel at that time. The second scene I want you to think about is, is slightly more um, well known, which is when Miriam and Aaron uh, speak out against Moses. This becomes a base text for the sin of Lashon Hara, evil tongue, maligning, malicious, lying. Um, this is the text, Numbers chapter 12, of what happens to a community where those safeguards on what discourse should and shouldn't look like um, are in breach. And so to take a step back, you have on the one hand the need for public discourse, the need for voices to be heard, and on the other hand you have um, the need for those voices to operate in a way that they are constructive um, and not destructive. Um, to build on Andre's opening remarks, and with this I'll close, I would say, from my modest perspective, I'm not a journalist, but it's not just the need for um, open discourse by way of Jewish media, but it's the need um, to, to have that exchange of ideas, which in a world of, you know, the blogosphere, anyone can put the darndest ideas, true or not, destructive or constructive on the web, which in my mind is why it's so important that there are also the people working tirelessly on this phone call to make sure that those ideas are given form, structure, um, an editorial process, the platforms by which they can exist and exchange um, uh, in robust dialogue, but in respectful dialogue. Um, that is, for me, uh, the role that um, Jewish journalism plays. If we don't have it, um, both the voices, um, but also those voices with a constructive posture, um, we as a Jewish community um, will, will it, it's, for me, it's a canary in a coal mine. As goes Jewish journalism, um, so to the Jewish community. If we don't have a place where ideas can be exchanged constructively, um, then the Jewish world has fundamental uh, problems um, that will, 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 will haunt us into our future. So the stakes are big, the dialogue's an important one, and I thank everyone here um, for being part of this important, important conversation. Thanks, Elliot. Um, I think it's over to me now, and thank you all for for being here. I'm, it's great for me to have had Elliot give us kick us off. Uh, he married my husband and I um, in 2004, and um, recently reminded me that I um, helped edit his first op-ed uh, for the Forward. I, I had actually misremembered it as having been for the New York Times, where I spent most of my career but it turned out it was for the forward. And we love having not just him in our pages, but um, just yesterday we were highlighting one of the Park Avenue Synagogue's um, teenage congregants, a young woman who won our, our youth writing contest. So it's great to have you, um, great to have you with us. I'm, I'm so excited also to have with us today, two of my former colleagues and, and uh, co-conspirators from the New York Times, Jennifer Preston and Peter Latman, um, who have gone on to really help to shape a incredibly important paradigm shifting movement um, in, um, our, in our journalism landscape. Um, Jennifer was a longtime um, editor and, and um, at the New York Times, and, a state house reporter in New Jersey. She just reminded me that she wrote a, her book about Bess Meyerson, which came out in the late 80s, that she uh, did a bunch of research with the Forward Archives there. So um, there's so many connections. And Peter, before he left the Times, was the media editor there. Um, they both have gone on to do these incre this incredibly important work, Jennifer at the Knight Foundation, which really is the 
most ambitious, broad umbrella group, fun, not just funding, but really shaping the idea of public service journalism. And uh, Peter at the Emerson Collective, and then through um, his work on, on the boards of various organizations, helping to really seed funding and be in the field. So they're both gonna really help us understand what's um, what's going on in the secular world that we could borrow from, learn from, be inspired by to, to build new structures and new ways of thinking about Jewish journalism. It's, it's I, I'm just thinking about this conversation and only right, right before the pandemic, I guess it must've been in early February, Craig Newmark, who's on this call and who's been one of the most important funders of public service journalism in the last few years, um, hosted a launch party for a new initiative called The 19th, which I hope many of you have heard of. It's, an, it's a new uh, nonprofit newsroom supporting coverage of women, um, particularly in, in the political sphere. And Jennifer and I, I think we're both there. I think Peter couldn't make it, but it was this incredibly par crowded space at Craig's townhouse in Manhattan. And um, I just looked around the room and couldn't believe the movement that um, he and Jennifer and Peter and Steve M. Goldberg of ProPublica and others had kind of built up over over a decade because none of that none of the organizations represented in that room even existed a few years ago. So we're very excited to have Jennifer and Peter here to help us understand them. I'd love to start with you, Jennifer, um, if you can kind of give us your perspective on like how this new way of thinking about funding and modeling journalism as a public service as an, an opportunity for philanthropists to support the things we need in our communities. Sure, thank you so much, Jody, and thank you very much uh, for inviting me to join this um, such important conversation, and it's such an important conversation um, now in particular. Uh, just a little bit about the Knight Foundation. It was founded by two brothers uh, who ran 26 newspapers around the country. And uh, they were very committed to not only producing high quality journalism, but they were very committed um, leaders and very active leaders in the communities where they uh, worked. So Knight Foundation focus is in the arts. Uh, it continues to work in these 26 cities around the country, which includes Miami and Charlotte, Philadelphia, St. Paul, and Akron, Ohio, where it all began with the Akron Beacon Journal. And, uh, and the foundation has been very committed, of course, to supporting journalism. Knight's mission is informed and engaged communities because, because for a community to be, uh, to thrive, for a community to be involved in, in civic life, for a community to, um, as we, heard just for the Jewish community how important it is for people to be informed and for people to be informed with accurate, uh, responsible um, journalism. And, and I specifically use the word journalism, not uh, news and information, because we have lots of news out there and we have lots of information. But what um, we don't have um, it's not as prevalent as it could be, should be, and that is really strong uh, reporting, especially at the local level, especially at, at the community um, level. So at Knight Foundation, we support new models, um, and I'm happy to share with you uh, following this um, webinar, an email with different links so that you can see some of the different models. One of them is the American Journalism Project, which uh, we jointly fund um, with uh, Peter Lattman here. And, um, and we also are helping legacy news organizations transition for the digital age. And I do think that over the last four or five years, we have learned a lot about how to support legacy organizations, organizations that have deep roots in their community to help them um, meet the digital realities of today. And I do think that is a huge opportunity um, today. And with advertising, digital advertising, print advertising vanishing, we know that uh, digital subscriptions, we know that membership are, are two uh, really great opportunities to drive sustainable growth uh, for journalism organizations. And, 
And so it's not just about new ways, uh, new models, it's about uh, helping um, preserve very important um, institutions in our communities. I realize I should back up a little bit, and I'm not sure which of you is best to, to help me with some of these numbers, but some of the stuff that I think we take for granted that people know, a lot of the people on the call who aren't working in journals may not, but so over the last decade, there's been a massive shrink in the number of journalism jobs and the number of newspapers, right? So how many journalism jobs lost, how many newspapers closed or news organizations closed? And then I think also if you could tell us um, the size of this growth in the, non, in the philanthropic and I guess venture capital too, investment in kind of creating this new sector. Give us a little bit of an overview of the size of the problem that we're trying to solve of the local news deserts and what's grown up. Sure. So, uh, so I can also put this link in the chat. Uh, Penny Abernathy is a professor at the University of North Carolina, and she's documented the, lo the loss of uh, more than uh, 3,000 um, local newspapers across the country. And the big problem with newspapers is newspapers have attracted the wrong type of capital. So many of the remaining large newspaper companies, such as Tribune, such as McClatchy, which is now in bankruptcy, such as... Um, Digital first media. These are these newspapers are now owned by private equity, um, and what their goal is is to is to uh, milk the cash cow, and that's what they're doing. And they're not reinvesting in these news operations across the country. And we're looking at maybe three or four years before um, before there is no more um, milk from the cow. And so what, uh, so what, so, so the problem is you could say, well, there's Facebook, there's local television, there's public radio, and we have seen a huge increase, especially among public radio uh, for, for more journalists um, joining not just, not just NPR, but local stations around the country. And there is a huge opportunity for local television news, but we have not seen yet um, many examples of commitments to provide deep uh, reporting and original reporting. Um, so what we have seen are multiple uh, not-for-profit organizations. There are now more than 200 not-for-profit organizations that belong to the Institute for Not-for-Profit News. And these, um, while very small in some places, uh, we have seen tremendous uh, growth in audience and in revenue. And one of the most exciting um, potential solutions, I mentioned the American Journalism Project. It's, it's the American Journalism Project is taking a, a philanthropic venture capital approach to the problem of local news by investing, um, they just invested in their first cohort. They have raised $45 million, including a $20 million commitment from Knight over the next five years to make the kind of capital investments that need to be um, made to provide the kind of business and technology uh, infrastructure uh, investments that have to be made to help build a new network of local news organizations. And we're also seeing with we work for example in in detroit we are seeing in so many cities the loss of local community um, news organizations and in detroit for example we uh, have been funding the detroit journalism cooperative which includes uh, the jewish uh, weekly newspaper um, there the along with news. other yes along with other yes along with other um, local community newspaper organizations. Great. Peter, I want to bring you in. Sorry to um, let you languish there, but um, Peter, you worked at the Wall Street Journal before coming to the Times, and now at the Emerson Collective is deeply engaged with the Atlantic, so has worked is, as well as with AJP and other uh, nonprofit initiatives. I, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about how you see things, both because you're working both in for-profit and nonprofit journals when you have the business background, um, uh, uh, and know so much about the, the industry. So Peter, I'd love your, you to kind of share your perspective on, on the, the way these different sectors are growing up and struggling and what the, what, what the philanthropic role is in particular. 
Sure. Um, and, and I'll just go on for a bit and I'd love to, you know, make this interactive and, and hopefully field some questions along with the rest of the panelists. But um, I was really struck by, um, by Elliot's words at, at the beginning um, because, you know, what Elliot was talking about um, was the importance of, um, you know, an independent Jewish media and the importance of a free Jewish press and the open exchange of uh, you know, Jewish ideas. And, and really, um, you know, I think he said that those words were, were rabbinical at the beginning, but really, if you just extract uh, the word Jewish from all of the, those remarks, um, that's really what uh, uh, Jen and I are, are trying to do, which is, um, you know, support an independent media and a free press and the exchange of ideas at a time when, you know, the business model of journalism is, you um, is largely uh, imperiled. So um, just a little background on, on where I work. Uh, the organization is called Emerson Collective. Um, I've been there about four and a half years now. Um, and, and like Jody said uh, previously, it was at the New York Times uh, working with Jody and Jennifer. Um, and Emerson is um, uh, started and run by Lorene Powell Jobs, um, who is uh, Steve Jobs' uh, widow. And um, she is involved in a number of different uh, philanthropic initiatives. Um, and I'll just tick them off real quick. Um, education, immigration, uh, climate, uh, and, and social justice. Um, and initially, and I think the evolution here is really important. Initially, um, her interest in uh, using media and journalism as a part of her overall work was um, was really to support the causes that she cared about. So what she was thinking was, okay, like I really want comprehensive immigration reform. So I'm gonna support, you know, immigration focused journalism that advances my cause. Um, and I joined her uh, in early 2016, you know, just before uh, Trump was elected. And, and that was really her um, original mission was to support her causes through media and journalism. But over the past four years, I mean, in part with, you know, with my working alongside of her, um, our mission has really uh, transformed and I think gotten much more ambitious. And that is simply, um, you know, at a time when the business model is imperiled, um, to support more broadly just a free press and an independent media for its own sake, because of, you know, how important it is, and this gets back to what Elliot was saying, like without, without it really, um, our democracy isn't going to survive. So um, what does that look like at Emerson? Um, uh, like a lot of Silicon Valley philanthropies, we do both investing and grant making uh, out of the same company. And, and the idea there is um, in terms of impact, um, we, we feel like we can have as much of, a, of an impact um, owning uh, the Atlantic, for instance, which we, which we acquired a couple of years ago. And you know, to, to become a steward of this important you know, 160 odd year old uh, publication and real journalistic institution, that's as important as uh, you know, making grants to places like uh, ProPublica or the Marshall Project, or uh, as Jen talked about the American Journalism Project, which is um, funding local journalism. Um, and I'll just end by uh, focusing in for a second on local journalism, which Jennifer uh, spoke so eloquently about. So it's almost become a cliche that, um, you know, local journalism is in crisis. Um, and and as, it, as it was mentioned, you know, thousands of newspapers have shut down over the past, um, you know, decade or so. And, uh, you know, our view is um, those newspapers are not coming back. Um, we think the business model is, um, is really uh, is dead, frankly, and what needs to emerge are, are new models. And what also needs to emerge is a understanding that the support of journalism is, um, is a civic good and, and that local journalism should no longer be thought about as a commercial enterprise. These, these papers used to have monopolies and they don't anymore because information is free. So you have to start supporting local journalism you know, in much the same way that we support a lot of our local institutions from libraries and museums to the ballet and the orchestras and that journalism is that public good. And it's going to take time because there's a lot of um, dislike of the media. Um, but we think that at the local level, it's the nonprofit models um, 
and as Jennifer noted, the sort of membership models um, that are going to be the successful ones. So I'd like to, we have a, a few minutes left before we bring in some of the other, my colleagues, my journalistic and publisher colleagues, but I um, want each of you to talk a little bit really concretely about some of the models and about how much money has been invested and, and, and granted to some, to these experiments and which ones you think work best. I know, I mean, two of the biggest are, you know, so the American Journalism Project with both, both you and Jennifer have talked about. Tell us how uh, much money they're investing in how many places and how that's supposed to work. And then the other, uh, another big one is Report for America, which I happened to be meeting with the founder um, yesterday, who's the guy who ran the LeafNet before. So he comes from a background similar to all of us. Um, they had, so Report for America is a, is a fellowship program like Teach for America or the Peace Corps, or AmeriCorps. They're bringing actually more, a little bit slightly more experienced journalists helping to fund, to have newsrooms, uh, get new staff to cover uh, local beats to serve local communities. And they told me, he told, Steve told me yesterday, they had 1800 journalist applicants. They placed 225 this year in 162 newsrooms. So it has become a huge $10 million a year uh, operation and AJP is even bigger than that, right, Peter? So talk about, tell us a little bit more concretely about AJP and then what other models you think are most exciting out there. And then we'll turn back to Jennifer for the same question. So um, I'll give a specific example um, that AJP is funding and just getting off the ground um, along with Report for America that gives a sense of, you know, how the, the ecosystem in journalism is changing at the local level. So um, West Virginia, um, one of the poorest uh, states in the country, um, you know, the Charleston Gazette Mail in, Char in the capital is the largest paper in West Virginia. Um, it went bankrupt uh, three or four years ago. Um, we actually, Emerson uh, looked at um, potentially buying um, the Charleston Gazette Mail uh, out of bankruptcy. But, um, you know, when you looked at the, um, the financial numbers, uh, it, was, uh, it was really uh, sort of abominable. And, and we didn't, feel like there was any way you could make that work. Um, a local businessman has bought it um, and it's, uh, it's not doing especially well. Um, there's not a great story there. So um, West Virginia, you know, wrestles with a lot of the same issues that the country issue uh, wrestles with, you know, writ small. So, you know, poverty, um, opioids, um, racism. Um, it's an incredibly important area of the country to report on. So AJP has teamed up with Report for America to fund something called um, West Virginia Spotlight. And they've uh, taken uh, some of the top reporters and editors from the Charleston Gazette Mail, and they're pairing them up with some of these junior reporters from Report for America, which Jody, you just mentioned. And we're funding a new newsroom, a new nonprofit newsroom that's gonna report on the important issues uh, in West Virginia. So the state house, you know, the courts, the police, um, the schools. And, um, you know, it's a, I think, it, I, Jennifer, you might know the numbers. It's a, it's a six figure, I think, investment to start in the, in the sort of mid six figure range. Um, but the idea is this won't succeed. The, the, this is the key part. Spotlight West Virginia won't succeed unless you ultimately have support from the local community. Um, so we could stand these things up, but ultimately you're going to have to get these local communities to support these organizations philanthropically. And that's the idea both of the AJP and the Report for America models generally. So AJP is taking, what is it, 30 some million dollars this year and granting two year grants to how many organizations? Do you remember, can you give us the numbers? Uh, Jen, the, the first cohort was like 11 or 12 organizations. Um, and we're gonna do another round roughly the same size uh, in the coming months. It, it's been slowed a bit by the, by the pandemic, but uh, that's, that's directionally. And the model up. is a two-year grant, and then you're supposed to be able to, to get started, and hopefully we'll be able to then raise the local funding to continue on your own, right? That's the, that's the philosophy? Um, Jen, you want to step in here? I don't want to Sure, talking. sure. All right. Sure. What it is, is to uh, make sure, uh, well, first off, the American Journalism Project was started by John Thornton, who's the founder of the Texas Tribune, and who is a um, venture capitalist. He's one of the partners of Austin, of, of the former Austin Ventures, which was considered by many as the between the coast, the most successful VC firm in the country. And it's also uh, founded by this uh, really uh, tremendously inspiring young woman, Elizabeth Green, who, um, who is the founder of Chalkbeat, 
which is another approach and to uh, it's another new model and it's another approach to serving communities, not with a newspaper that that has sports and politics and education. It's completely focused on delivering education coverage and also delivering education coverage in a new way by really engaging with parents and through civic engagement and, and through community engagement. Um, so so the, Ameri the thinking behind the American Journalism Project is not just to invest money, but to also, but to also invest invest expertise in coaching in the same way a VC doesn't just, you know, dump in money in a, in a company and walk away, you know, they're there making sure that the um, governance is right. They're taking seats on their boards. They're making sure that the business and the technology, you know, infrastructure is in place. And at Knight Foundation, I got to tell you, after the New York Times all these years, I thought, oh, wow, I'm going to be able to be um, an editor in a two billion dollar foundation, thinking that I was going to be, you know, approving stories, right? Funding stories. No, I don't get to fund stories. I get to fund accountants, you know, because what we are seeking to do is to drive sustainable growth for journalism, because that's what has to happen right now. We need to we need to identify the paths, pathways, and and um, and Peter and I have debated, you know, whether uh, new models or or investing also in in legacy media, and and we think that we have found some really promising um, pathways for legacy media to um, to evolve and to have a robust financial picture. And one of those ways is to, you know. Uh, Think about advertising as corporate responsibility dollars. Think about uh, digital subscriptions or subscriptions as membership. Think about the relationship that you must change. Like when you're running a newspaper today, you have to change your relationship with your community. You can't just be in the broadcast business. You really have to listen. You really have to uh, reflect the communities that 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 you serve. So these are all um, very positive positive trends. Of course, what we're just deeply alarmed by is the uh, positive trends are accelerating with COVID nineteen, but so are the negative trends. And so that's why a major reason why so many. Um, alternative weekly newspapers, community newspapers uh, in the community and ethnic press because of the just local advertising, digital advertising, print advertising, it went, you know, vanished. It was on the decline. We've all been watching that, but it vanished. So that's like why this is a time for philanthropy to step up and to really explore how we how we in foundations, at foundations, and how we can support these incredibly important institutions and new models that are committed to, you know, I, and I love, um, Peter, how you went back to Rabbi Cosgrove, and I saw, I'm going to go um, do the reading afterwards, <laughs> Numbers Great. Chapter 12. Yeah, you should all, uh, you know. <laughs> yeah, I have to do a whole blog Thank post around Thank you so much, it. Jennifer Thanks. and Peter. And I'm so glad, Jennifer, that you talked about, you know, when we talk about new models, we're talking about not just new financial models, but new yep. distribution models, new engagement models, yep. new ways of thinking about everything that media has done. Um, kicking it back to you, Andre, so we can get into that a little bit more about thinking about how, how, we, how we really work all these new media models. Thank you so much, Peter and Jen. For joining us and, and I think you're sticking around but when we get into questions we'll, we can bring you back in. Thank you Peter and Jen that was that was uh, very interesting and eye-opening in terms of the the landscape uh, outside of the Jewish community in this in the secular world of philanthropy and media and and journalism. Um, I just wanted us I, I just want us to pivot to use this word that everybody's using these days from the general uh, secular conversation to the Jewish community. Um, we may have some uh, similarities with local journalism, and we may not. Some of these uh, models of nonprofit journalism, of public service journalism, could be good for us, and some may not. So I wanted to, and, and by the way, just one thing that just keep bouncing in my head, 
what uh, Peter was saying about um, Steve Jobs' widow funding the areas she cared about, is that the same as public service journalism or is that using media as a, as a, as a bullhorn for your own ideas and is that what we want in the Jewish community? So all that's a very important questions and I wanna give it over to Ami Eden from the JTA that will um, uh, talk with his own colleagues from Jewish journalism about these issues. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I'm Ami Eden. I'm the CEO and executive editor of 70 Faces Media, which is, um, in terms of news, that's the, our news brand is the Jewish Telegraphic Agency, over 100 years old, and mainly, in addition to our own news site, we work with 70 different clients, many of them local, where we give them syndication con content. And as we go through the discussion, hopefully each of you can just get, say a word about um, where you sit in the universe. Um, I think I'm the only publisher in this group. So I just want to take, and I do deal with like all the local papers. So I just want to take one minute to kind of answer Andres's first question, which is like, how does our environment economically kind of compare to the models that are out there? And then I'm, I want to um, ask each of you a bunch of questions. I would just say from where I sit, it's very similar dynamic in that um, I think Jewish media on a national level is experiencing a golden age. And the bottom line is, um, people can read more types of compelling great brands um, than they ever could have. Yair works for, you know, tablet didn't exist 10 years ago. Um, you know, the fact that the forward has a, di a dynamic um, website there, uh, you know, all we have a bunch of new brands and 70 faces media, they're reaching different types of audiences. So on a national level, there are a lot of different um, offerings and, you know, and a lot of, and we've had an ability to tap into different um, foundations, philanthropists, different um, business revenue models, a lot of incredible different editorial experimentations, and a lot of different voices and approaches. And on the local level, it's the opposite, right? It's, um, it's a, they used to be the dominant means of media in our community. They're reaching fewer and fewer people. Um, the advertising bases have um, continue to evaporate. Um, they don't have an, a critical audience size to build a profitable digital model around. Um, they can't micro target, right? Yair, can, tablet can have a certain kind of Jewish person in mind who's gonna love tablet and as a portion of our six million person community, that'll work. And the same with the forward and the same with our brand. On the local level, you can't, there's just not enough people to start having niche, niche publications that are gonna reach and hence appeal to different kind of um, local advertisers or funders. So I would say that's sort of like where we stand. And, and I'd say most of the national brands are not thinking hard or have not executed hard on how we could also serve a local capacity. And frankly, the local funders and philanthropists I do not, I have not seen a recognition that they think of national media as potentially providing solutions to their local communities. And so that's, that's kind of where I would make a snapshot. Happy for any of you um, to give a different snapshot if you differ, disagree. But I think the first question I would ask each of you is picking up on Jody, what you said at the end, that it's not just about different business models, but different editorial models, engagement models. I'm wondering how each of you views your you know, what you're doing in the universe, you know, what, what, how has it changed in terms of thinking about forming community, building audiences that are coming together, identity, and, you know, the kind of the roles you, you, you try to play um, beyond just the conveying of news information. Um, so, Jody, happy to start with you. Oh, I was um, going to say we should start with Andy because I've been okay. blabbing about. Okay, go ahead. Okay, happy to start. Thanks, Ami. Thanks, Jody, for uh, helping put this together. Um, I think you hit it on the head, Ami, that um, right there are like a golden age is an interesting way to look at it, that we have great national voices. But, you know, I've come from two local newspapers now. Uh, I'm at the Jewish Week now in New York. And before I was at JTA, I was at the New Jersey Jewish News. And both are good, I would say, great legacy Jewish weekly newspapers. Um, and they both have a, a struggling business model is what it comes down to. Um, sometimes overlooked because you know the assumption is new york is such a big and powerful community um that that the paper must be a you know a nice fat cow but it's not like we're we're being hit by 
all the market forces everyone else is, and uh, COVID only made things worse. Um, to me, the importance of a local, and what I've always stressed in my in my career is 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 not the national stuff, but it is the local stuff, because a, a, a Jewish newspaper creates a sense of community, um, and it may be one of the last Jewish institutions that does it. Um, we don't have broad based rabbinical rabbinical councils that include all the denominations. Um, JCCs don't have quite the cash they, cachet they used to, and right now, you know, their financial struggles. So, if you want broad-based, non-ideological, or multi-ideological, multi-denominational, um, diverse conversations um, that kind of pull your own community together and give everyone else in the community a sense of the guy I never would talk to normally, I have to confront him in the pages of a Jewish newspaper. That's an essential function. That's the one I've always loved most about it. Journalism is great, and we do journalism, and that's part of it. But um, I've always been about promoting those conversations. And that's, as the ecosphere begins to shrink, that's what you're losing. And then you can have a national conversation, but that doesn't really get down to what's happening around the corner. Um, I live in a town with 21 shuls, synagogues. And um, I don't think people between synagogues would know what each other are doing, even though it's a rich, vibrant Jewish community, if they didn't have their local paper to look at. And, and remind each other the struggles and the common challenges and the stupid thing the guy down the block is thinking and saying, which is often part and also part of the Jewish conversation. So I, I'm a big believer in local in, in, in a local Jewish journalism. Uh, yeah, you're, I mean, you're, 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 I think, a great um, avatar of like, the, like when I talk about a golden age of national media and the, like, I don't know that somebody like you could have existed 20 years ago where you could be in the, you know, being a great columnist and blogger and bringing all sorts of issues to the floor and sparking a national conversation on different issues. I'm wondering from where you sit, like, how do you view your role in this kind of, not just journalism as being the writing that you do and great ideas that you're, you know, you're putting out there, but, you know, what, what role, if any, do you have when it comes to you and Tab, but when it comes to creating some sense of community or bringing people together, you know, do, do those concepts and terms mean anything to you, you know, or do you just see your role as you guys are great publication and you are a great columnist blogger? No, it's a good question. And I think you're right to put it to me because I do something that's different than some of the other things that tablet does. And what's interesting about tablet is that it has inward facing and outward facing aspects. Um, if you look at what we publish, we can be publishing things that help you uh, have a more meaningful uh, Pesach um, or do uh, putting on whether it's doing a Zoom Seder, right, or just very practical how to's get your wax off of your menorah, right, but stuff that's clearly obviously oriented towards the Jewish community and uh, other Jews and Jewish readers. And then we also publish things and you publish people like me who the predominant stuff that I do, even if it's about the Jewish community, and I write a lot about the Jewish community, obviously, is I don't think of myself as writing for Jews. I think of myself as writing from the Jews uh, to everyone else. Um, and because I have certain areas of expertise and certain insights, I can then bring those to bear on national conversations and hopefully say something that other people aren't saying. Um, which to me is sort of a, a useful creative advantage because if everyone else is writing about the exact same political developments or social developments, but I can bring that sort of stuff to bear, right? I, it makes it much easier for me to figure out what I have that's actually useful to say. Um, and so like, that's why, you know, people know me from Twitter. What is, the, what is Twitter useful for, for me? Most of my followers on Twitter aren't Jewish, right? Most of the people who find Tablet through me on Twitter um, otherwise might not have found it and might not have heard a Jewish voice on a lot of these things. So, so, um, just, to start, yeah. so just to then turn it then to Tablet, like let's yeah. speak for Tablet generally, when you guys sit around and you think about your role within the Jewish world, how, does it overlap at all with, you mentioned the idea of making people have a more meaningful Pesach, like how do you think about your role beyond just being a great read, right? Like what does it come, like what role do you guys see yourselves playing as a national media outlet helping people 
people with their Jewish identity, building Jewish community, et cetera. Is that like, how does that Yeah, work? so this is different from having someone who has editorial oversight of everybody else and asking right. them what they do. So I describe a little bit of what I do, uh, but right. I talked about the inward and the community aspects. So it's very useful to look at what we've been doing right now. And Jody can speak to the forward doing a lot of things like this too, which is we thought, what does our audience need right now? What does the Jewish community need right now when coronavirus happens? Um, and suddenly Tablet really transformed and started doing a bunch of things we hadn't been doing before or leaning into certain things that were just one of the facets of what we were doing at the time. Uh, so concretely uh, around Pesach, uh, we used sort of our network to uh, collect from people. We first, we surveyed readers and people beyond our readership, what they needed for Pesach, given that people were stuck at home and they couldn't go places or get things they normally would have for resources. And then we started linking readers with people who we knew could help them in their communities, right? And that was something that we were able to do because we had such a wide audience and people were willing to tell us what they needed. So people who needed Haggadot, we helped them get Haggadot. They needed kosher food, they did that. Another example, uh, kids can't go to their Hebrew schools. So we created a podcast called Hebrew School, which is actually, I would say, our most uh, fancy produced podcast, because what it is is a sort of game show that's hosted by two of our writers, uh, Stephanie Butnick and Miel Libowitz. Um, and they host it with a kid as a participant, and they do trivia questions on around particular Jewish topics. Thus, you learn by listening and by playing, but you don't feel like it, that it's like it's school. Uh, but it's actually quite educational. It's a lot of fun. There's musical stuff. There's, it's, uh, you know, I, I just, it's hard to describe. I encourage you to listen to it. They had a kid from, who's like a diplomat's kid, who Jewish girl who lives in The Hague, right? Uh, yeah. Describing, right, her life. And so kids also learn about different types so, of Jews from all over. So, uh, so yeah. Oh, no, so I just, not to cut you off, I just want to jump yeah. to, yeah, to Jody. And, and before I move, I'll just, I'll just underscore something that you, you said that definitely applies to Seven Face and Media. Definitely, I'm sure, applies to the forward and probably does not apply to Jewish Week in the same way, which gets a part of the problem. National, local papers are undercapitalized. When things happen, there's no ability to seize opportunity, to invest, to create, to innovate. On the national level, I think, I, I, given what I see from the forward and tap, and I know internally, we're spending a lot of time, even in this environment, launching new initiatives, for, you know, figuring out new things to do. How can we respond? Um, Jody, you are really unique in this group in terms of having incredible experience, you know, at the New York Times outside of the, well, we'll say outside the Jewish journalism world, but we could debate what that means. Um, now that you're moving into the forward and where you sit, does that, can you bring some perspective in like how, how did you function as a journalist at the New York Times and including an audience building role that, is what you're doing now the forward, do you see it as the same role or are you playing a different role when it comes to audience building community and the, and the purposes of journalism? How, how is it different? Thank you. Thanks for the question. It's a great one. Uh, first of all, I will say the forward is radically undercapitalized as well. Um, although we yep, are so true. grateful for, for Craig Newmark and other people who uh, on this call who support us, at, you know, our board members are on this call who give generously um, we are operating in a deficit and we are struggling to every every story. I mean, as we have tried to respond to this pandemic with um, expanded, you know, news coverage, reopening our scribe platform, more service journalism, some of the things that um, that yet yeah, you're talked about. Um, you know, every dollar we spend, it's a lot of dollars we spend we don't have, and it's certainly taking a dollar away from something else. So we are, you know, we're hardly. Uh, yeah, I should know, echo that. I, I shouldn't have overstated. I really meant it. No, it's really point. important to no. say, like, we are. This is not a like theoretical yeah. conversation. When when Elliot talks and Andres talks about what the Jewish world would look like if we didn't have any original reporting and if we didn't have a platform yeah. for civil discourse on the issues that divide us that doesn't come from an advocacy perspective, they're talking about like what happens if we right. don't come up with a new sustainable financial model very soon when we go out of business. It's not it's not right. like a joke, you know. I mean it is so I want to start there, and then I, I say, yeah. You know, there are, so there are certainly differences that relate to everything you've talked about. About what does it mean to be a? Com we are a community publication. The Forward is a community publication for a vast and diverse and sets of overlapping communities, but nonetheless, a community publication, much more uh, than the New York Times, you know, is. Although I want to go back to this, the 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 kind of really important thing you talked about about national and local, um, and tell you a little bit about how I see that because. Um, 
you know, I do, I really believe, and I know Jennifer, you know, shares this at her core too, you know, to me, local journalism is, is the, is the, the, the local beat reporting is the foundation of all good reporting. I remember once I was interviewing um, a guy, a candidate to be a city hall reporter at the New York Times, and he had come back from Iraq. He had just been covering the war there. And he told me about a story he'd done, which was about uh, the, the, homicide detectives in Baghdad and what they, how they were operating. I'm like, that's a local reporter. He's covering a war, but he's trying to figure out what the cops are doing and how, you know, and it's like, that's the basis of all good reporting. So one of the most important jobs I did at the New York Times was I spent years as the bureau chief in the Midwest. Um, a lot of people on this call know I was a bureau chief in Jerusalem, but before that I was a bureau chief in Chicago. I covered 11 Midwestern states, which was all a bunch of local communities. Um, and people would often say like, maybe you want to do this story. People in New York will, this is about how it relates to New York or what New Yorkers, and it's like, no, no, we're covering Illinois, about and for Illinois and Iowa and Nebraska and it, but not only for them. We really want everybody in the world, country then and now in the world to right. understand the local stories of national or international interest and impact. So when we taught, and then in my, one of the roles I did the, at the end of my career at the New York Times was I led our global expansion to really think about engaging international readers. And we opened a much bigger presence in Australia. What do Australians want from the New York Times? They, what they don't want is the same thing they have from their kind of fairly lame local news outlets that were cut and decimated. They, they don't want us to replace local news. They want a national outlet that can bring local news with a national, international, different kind of lens. And that's what we're trying to build at the forward as well. And this is both about you know, what, what's good for the forward, but it's also to me about this new model question. The old model of local Jewish journalism it, it, it's not just that it doesn't work because there's been a shift in the, in the market. It wasn't like really a great model because it wasn't really about the readers. The advertising that filled the New York Times, frankly, but also all the, the, you know, I used to work at the Middlesex News was my first internship in Massachusetts. Most of what was in that paper was not the critical stuff that readers need. It was stuff that filled the pages between the advertisements that the advertisers wanted, not because they cared about original reporting and journalism, but because they cared about that audience spent buying their products. So there was accountability journalism, high-end journalism on making sure leaders like did the right thing, business leaders, political leaders. And there was hyper-local journalism that was like telling you, you know, showing you pictures of your high school kids in their basketball games. Most of the middle was crap, you know, and I wrote a lot of that stuff when I worked in local journalism too. But so what we have an opportunity to do now is to really get focused on what are the essential components of coverage of local communities. What, it, what do people really need to know about what's happening in the Miami Jewish community or the Boston Jewish community? That's gonna be of interest, Not it's of critical interest to Boston Jews and Miami Jews, but it's also of interest to all of us because it's about the diversity in the fabric of our world. So I don't think there's a conflict between national and local. I actually think local are the building blocks of a national publication. And I think that one of the great functions of JTA can be to you know, help us all see what we need to get away from, in my view, is like the competitive model where we all do the same stories. I think we want to build a model that it's like, we want our readers, our core readers who are coming to us to see as much good journalism as we can from wherever it comes from. And we want our journalism that we're spending the dollars we barely have to create to get as wide an audience and serve the readers in as big a way as possible. That's it. <laughs> And I think, and I, you know, and, yeah, and I, and I think one of the things I would highlight is that we, I think all of us are increasingly um, um, trying to figure out the expanded role that the community needs from us on, and part, it, it, like, when I'm listening to this, I'm thinking about the fact that when I first came into Jewish journalism, to me, it was, like, very similar to the general community, which was the, the regular newspapers, like, I want to work at the fourth estate in the Jewish community, and, like, we need a freedom of the press. And we still need to do that, right? But at the same time, we have this bigger problem, which I think Yair has referred to, and that we, there's so many American Jews who the bigger problem is they don't care enough to care what the freedom of the press has to expose or the difficult conversations. So we find a lot of us are becoming the venues to do other, help, like, again, yeah, help people figure out the, how, how to have the satyrs, how to have Jewish meaning. Um, and, you know, as we do more of that, how, how do we fund that? And, and, and Jody, you're saying taking on yet another responsibility, which is those of us on the national level, how do we revamp our brands and expand our brands to think about not replacing the Jewish local paper and all its 
all its scope, but to at least do a level of reporting that's surfacing up local stories and taking our, our successful national models. And all of that obviously is gonna require, you know, I said, you know, we need capitalization to do what we do now to then do this innovation. And I, and I guess for this group, what I'd say is from where I sit, again, there's some level of success that we've had in helping Nash, the big national funders sometimes understand investments in Jewish media. I don't see that there's been an effective dialogue of helping local funders see how an investment in the national media can help innovate in ways that meet the needs of the local. And to be clear, when I say national, each of us has the ability to look at our web metrics and say, we're reaching tens of thousands, over 100,000 people in your community. But, ha but when, what we're not doing is talking to those people about in any way what's happening in their community. So how do we have a dialogue? And Andres, you brought up a very important point, which is how, how do we bring together investment and funding in a way though, that is preserving our ability and expand while, while respecting what we have to do editorially. Because if yeah. all we're doing is getting support to be a megaphone for somebody's pet cause, we're not gonna we're not gonna succeed in building that um, yeah that, that that a meaningful local audience that it's gonna resonate. So and by the I, way, I, those I, those outlets are well capitalized. The advocacy outlets are the ones right. with the right, right. And then, right. So, that's who, that's you know we have the one thing I want to mention is that the Jewish nonprofit world kind of pioneered nonprofit support for local journalism. I mean. Uh, you know, 50 years ago, um, maybe half the papers in the Jewish papers in the country were, you know, either, you know, they were produced or funded by their local Jewish federations. Now, a lot of them were terrible. A lot of them were house organs, but there were some really good journalistic outlets. I mean, you came from one, um, the, the Jewish Exponent. Um, I've had experience Washington Jewish Week in Washington. I mean, these, you know, these were funders who said, you know what, we need a non-ideological, credible voice, and we're willing to put our institutional money behind it. Some of that's missing on the local level is because now with the, as, as needs are getting stronger and federate and um, local uh, dollars are shrinking, um, you're in competition with widows and orphans and uh, food banks and Jewish education, especially day school, and we become a harder sell. And the case I always try to make is where you're a conduit to those communities in two, in two directions. In one direction, we're doing the service journalism that identifies those needs. And, and, and in another direction, we're yeah. informing the community about the kinds of differences Jewish philanthropy is making. So I, I find this, and without that conduit, you're depending on an outsider to tell your story and knowing people's frustration with their local general interest dailies and, and, and other, and, and other um, media outlets. I'm not sure you want other people to tell that story or, and you certainly can't rely on them to do it. No, I, I, I think there is, so first of all, thank you. Uh, to our panel and I, I want to say, you know, and I said it at the beginning, but I'll say it now, this is obviously the beginning of a conversation and we're just kicking off uh, a dialogue on these issues and hopefully we're going to talk more because we, we don't have a lot of time now. Uh, but uh, from the Jeff and perspective, we, we're now committed to continue this and we, you're going to be hearing from us on how we can, we can I, I just think we're just scratching the surface here and there are a lot of things to talk. One of the things that I you know, thinking when, when I'm hearing Andy speak is that, you know, there's a symbiotic relation between interest in Jewish issues in general and in Jewish participation and interest in Jewish media. You know, the reason why it was important for folks to read the Jewish newspaper is because Jewish activism and being in the Jewish community was a very important part of their lives. Uh, if that is not the case anymore, so how do we recreate that interest in a, in a way? But, but I, wanna, I wanna start with a softball question. Uh, that is, you know, sort of the elephant in the room. How do you, I mean, the, the problem of philanthropic support is that how do you, how do you keep uh, your media outlet independent uh, or your journalism independent when you're, su you're supported by people that may be upset about some of the things you write or may disagree with it. So if anybody want to take a, you know, 20 second stab at answering that. I'll just say, I just, I'll, I'll do it really quickly. It really depends. I mean, 
it depends on on the funders and their expectations going in. Um, and you know, and in some ways, I don't want to see right there mercy, but certainly if you have people who get it and they really they they respect the quality of the publication over whether they agree with every editorial, whether they agree with every front page article, then you get, then you then you're lucky. And it is a matter of luck. And sometimes it's also a matter of board development. I mean, if you have a, a legacy brand that's that's reaching out and and um, you know finding new you know new funders, there's a there's a list you go you don't you don't go to someone who's known to be you know supremely ideological to fund this project, but you have to find the people who say you know what I care about the 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 conversation more than I care about winning it. Yeah, you don't want to take that? So I actually just wanted to hear what uh, the other panelists had to say, because they're the ones who run publications. I just write for one. So I can tell you the opposite perspective, which is the experience of writing a tablet. And people ask me that. They'd say, like, you know, you're a writer at a publication that relies a significant uh, amount on philanthropy. We obviously have reader donations, but it's hugely reliant on philanthropy. So does that cause any issues? And I can just say from my experience, one of the reasons I really appreciate writing for tablet is that I've been there, what, now writing there full time for something like five years or something. And I've never been told about anything that I've written by anyone above me, you can't say that, or can you change how you say that? Or you said it this way and it bothered this person, can you say it differently next time? And the truth is, if somebody started telling me that, I'd start probably looking for some other places to write. Uh, because I, I, you know, like many journalists, I very much value my voice and my independence. Um, and so the challenge for, I think, people on the top, you know, the editors and people like that and those who work with funders is to be able to create that healthy relationship where the writers that you want to foster in the first place feel comfortable saying what they need to say and what the community needs to hear, yeah. right? And I know that if I need to tell the Jewish community something, even if it's difficult, I know that I'll be protected not just by my editors, but by whoever's funding us. And that I really, you know, I appreciate that. And I have no idea for the most part who, half the, who those people are. On occasion, I accidentally discover someone who funders, funds us because I meet them. Um, and I think that's very important that, like Andy says, that relationship where you understand the value is the conversation, having people who can hold a mirror up to your community, who can connect you to parts of your community you otherwise might not be able to connect you to, right? Seeing those as values in and of themselves rather than a means to an end. Right. Thank you. Uh, yes. I, only if you want me to jump in on that. I yeah, can. of course. Uh, you know, I think there's a couple components to this, and and the question that was posed by uh, Jonathan Horowitz was, you know, to Peter about what happens if the Atlantic, you know, has a has a juicy scoop on, on Apple, um, is is, a, is an interesting one, I, and, I, and we obviously have that the, those those issues have come up in the Jewish press before. I guess to me, some of the components are. I think you know. You, ideally, it's it's really important to have a real mix of funders. That you know, publications shouldn't be dependent on a single funder or on funders from a single kind of side of an issue or side of a political map. Um, there are publications that that are you know funded by single funders, and I think that the the stability there and the the confidence that readers can have in that those publications' independence is is uh, less. And I think one of the reasons that we're so interested in in sort of thinking about sparking a broader initiative to think about something like the Foundation for Jewish Camp, Foundation for Jewish Journalism, that would, that would be this kind of mix of funders is to ensure that. The second component that I think is essential is transparency. Um, I was at the Knight Media Forum uh, shortly before the pandemic set in, and there was a lot of conversation about one organization that doesn't uh, let people know who its funders are and how kind of controversial and co problematic that can be. I think readers need to be able to know who all your funders are. Um, and I think the third thing I would say is that like, I'm really interested to hear Peter say the background for Lorene uh, Jobs on, on I want to advance um, my causes by making sure there's good reporting about them. But I've said several times, like, you know, I don't, I, we are, we, our ideology is the ideology of inquiry. We want people who believe as Elliot Cosgrove does, as Andres does, who believe um, that inquiry and independence and original reporting and accountability reporting are important to the community as an end in themselves, not to advance a particular view on Israel or intermarriage or climate change or whatever, but actually for the value of the thing, of this information. And that in the long term, you really believe that independent truth-telling 
and storytelling and service journalism and discourse are are valuable regardless of how it comes out regardless you know i don't now look the the the, the question posed about like what happens about you know if there's a scandal around one of their funders is a real thing. Um, we really have to do it. And the only, you know, you just have to make sure that the editorial independence is protected. The other side is also true. What about when your funders want to tell you about, um, you know, their friend's book or art show or this great initiative in, you know, Eastern Europe that they're also supporting with their philanthropy? And shouldn't we cover more of that? Because it's so great and important. And it might be, but you need independent editorial judgment about those things too, about how that, that it's not just because the f person who give, pays your salary also is paying for that initiative. So, so, so Jody, so, so Jody, in a way, separating the philanthropic support from the individual outlet could be could be a could be a model that as works. As long as we here. get a lot of it, yes. No, <laughs> yeah, I think so. I mean, I do think so. I think so. We... So to create sort of to create sort of a, a sort of a third party kind of support fund for for whatever that you know it's complicated, but it would be a model. I'm conscious of the time, so I. And I, I want to, I know that a lot of people may, may have, you know, uh, commitments and, and we, we took, we took a lot of your time. Uh, but um, I, so I want to formally close by thanking our, our panelists and, uh, and the practitioners and, and all of you who participated and to say a, and to voice a commitment that we have at JFN to continue this, this conversation. And as I said, this is just for you guys to give you a taste, a flavor of the conversations that we need to have in terms of, of Jewish media. I mean, this is just a teaser for uh, very serious work that needs to, to come in terms of gathering both funders and practitioners in reimagining the, the, the landscape of, of Jewish media and coming up with ideas like the one we just, you know, brainstorm, um, you know, while standing on one foot. Uh, special thanks for Peter and Jen to bring us uh, insights from the secular world. And look at, um, look at the chat box because there is uh, tons of interesting resources there. And you are going to be hearing from you more now. Those of you, um, we're doing this thing now with the Jeff and webinars. We formally close it, but those of you that want to stay on and keep talking, I'm, I'm going to stay here for another 15 or so minutes. So all those that want to stay uh, can stay and we can continue conversation. And I'm actually going to kick it up with a um, kick it off with um, with a question. Um, from the, um, like one of the things that, are, that I'm like, that, that is very intriguing for me is a fund to support journalism. What would be a good way to organize that? If I was a funder, I said, you know what? I want to put a bunch of cash into such a program. What would work for you guys as practitioners? And if Peter and Jenny want to jump in and say what has worked in the secular community, that would be also good. I mean, I, I, just from where I sit, I, I do think um, for all of us, clearly revenue generation is going to be the ultimate question mark. So, to, you know, any effort that bolsters our ability to figure out, you know, new philanthropic models and to pursue them, but also to develop different business revenue generating ideas, whether it has to do with, um, you know, the services, the B2B services or different models for paywalls and, you know, technology that can build up user revenue support. Anything in the revenue sphere um, is, you know, in terms of a long-term impact is going to be probably, the you know, is going to be really valuable. And I also think it easy for us, to, easier and potentially to help a lot of us sort of gain knowledge or strategies, et cetera, you know, where we might have some shortcomings. Um, that is one thought, but again, I walk around with a publisher hat as well as an editorial hat, so I might be biased in that regard. I think, I think one of the things that's hard as, as I'm getting to know the world of, of working in a, you know, a nonprofit with a deficit, like, is just that there's, there, you know, you have, to, 
I, I wonder if we couldn't, if we create, if there, if we created a, a fund, a general fund, and some kind of a general grant making institution that publishers and editors could sort of apply to either on an ongoing basis or an annual basis for, on a, for projects, right? So you, and it could it could span the gamut from, you know, the model of American Journalism Project is essentially a news organization or a startup idea for a news organization applies for a grant to get off the ground and did the, report for America is you apply for a grant to have a single reporter work for one or two years. But you could also do, we would like to start this podcast and we need X thousands of dollars. We would like to do a series, an investigative series on anti-Semitism and we need X thousands of dollars. We would like to add a reporter to cover communities of color. We need X thousands of dollars. So you could arrange it. It could be that, it could be all of those things or it could be uh, narrowly. But if there was a fund and then there was some group of people that was probably a mix of funders and practitioners, you know, as an arbiter of the fund, I think it would help not only increase cooperation, journalistic cooperation among the different news organizations and help to do this amplification of existing voices, but also reduce uh, repeated efforts on fundraising. You know what I mean? Like we don't have enough resources in this industry to afford all of us making parallel proposals to all the people on this call. You know, it's like if there was a way to consolidate, I mean, I assume that's what the how, why the foundation for Jewish camp kind of exists and how it functions is, I don't know anything in detail, but it's like, yeah. everyone in it is interested in camp. But the, foundation, but the foundation for Jewish culture, which was a similar model, didn't, didn't really work out. So it's, it's, it would be interesting maybe to sort of- uh, I, I, I think if you went with Jody's model though, I would still, and I'd love to hear from the foundation people. I mean, I would definitely put the emphasis on proposals that are scalable or that can be retrofitted to other fields like to start having that kind of centralized body but it's really like the forward has an idea for a great story or we have an idea or it's like it, it, i think you're going to really wow. you're going to really benefit from that approach if you force the applications that have some kind of you know field building growth potential beyond just the immediate project yeah that's super smart like it, yeah right but Andy, I mean, you are you are the most for reader engagement or for reader feedback, and then everybody can get right. the technology across the field. That's great. Uh, Andy, you are the more dependent, I think, from the panel on advertising, right? Or well, the business model yeah. has historically been dependent on advertising. Right. Do you think do you think there's a future for that, or would you just said let's just not bother? Let's just um, it's not in the, it's it's just it's not paying the bills. I mean, you can try, but it's you know it's it's the same market forces that are, that are that are wiping out local papers. Um, certain niche publications can get away with it. And most of these niche publications, they, they don't invest heavily on their staff side. Um, they're mostly there for the advertisers. Um, it goes back to the model that Jody talked about, talked about earlier. So the, the advertising is, you know, it, it's, it, it's great what you get, but it just doesn't pay the bills. And that's what I always worry about projects where you're constantly, you know, writing grants for projects which in some ways make more work and you still can't keep the lights on. Sometimes I just need a general fund that helps, you know, that helps a backstop on my budget. So that, that's another way I want to think about it. If you're always asking for that special reporter or that new podcast, meanwhile, you know, you haven't paid your printer. I mean, you have an issue. I would um, also say just one other thing is that, you know, a national fund could also some of the successful funds, and I think that includes the fund for uh, the Jewish Camping uh, Foundation, um, they leverage local dollars, matching dollars. That's really important to say, listen, here's a, we're willing to put this up if you can get local people to match it and vice versa. And that's really important because in addition to the elevator pitch I'm gonna to make to any one of our local funders, it's really great to have some national figures with deep pockets where able to say, we stand behind that message. And we think you should too. Yeah. And we're going to match you with that. And Andy, it works both ways because yeah. uh, because I think it's the uh, that the, lo the 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 local it helps you with the local funders have national funders. But I also think ha like we need to we need to help local funders understand that we're actually reaching lots of people in their communities in right. very meaningful ways. And again, we can their money can help us reach them in the ways that have a local relevance as well. And that. Mm -hmm. Again, I think that's an awareness that's not, is not there. Andres, I want to jump in on advertising for a sec, if I may, because I, I did mention yeah. this before, but I, I really learned something so important as the New York Times successfully transitioned to a really different business model. 
I, there was something so important that came out of that, which isn't, it's not, it's not just because advertising is disappearing. It's because advertisers were not investing in the thing the New York Times was actually trying to do. Advertisers were trying to, you know, buy space to sell their products to rich people who also wanted the New York Times' independent reporting. But the newsroom and the business side were at odds because the newsroom wanted to do, you know, like really great original reporting and the business side, often those advertisers didn't want to be near any stories about anything complicated or difficult. Now the business model of the New York Times is selling journalism, selling good reporting to readers. That's the business model. So the business side and the journalists are in lockstep on the mission. The mission is original reporting, good journalism, truth. And I think that that, although the New York Times obviously is a, is a for-profit business, um, at times it was a non-for-profit by accident, but um, not anymore, the, it relates to that conversation we're having about the, the sort of philosophical shift, the paradigm shift, the idea of philanthropic investment in this commodity of truth and of original reporting and of civil discourse. And the one, it's not just that we should move away from an advertising model because there aren't advertisers anymore that want to pay for it. It's because they weren't actually wanting the thing we need for our communities. And what we need now is a business model that's about the thing we want to create and we believe serves the community. I want to ask, just Andre, just one, just a yeah. quick point, which is that I'm also the only, I think I'm looking around, I'm the only panelist. We still put out a print publication. So the advantage of print is that you can charge more for your ads. The, the downside is that it doesn't pay for printing and postage. So you're in this, you know, you're in this spiral. So, the, you know, the digital, the digital space is both more economical, but also less likely to pull in the kind of ad dollars that was that print newspapers took for granted. So we're dealing with that as well. Right, but Andy, you'll reach for it. You need require, if it was totally philanthropically funded, and you were just digital, it would be much cheaper to run, and the pe the number of people you would meet reach is exponentially higher. Mm -hmm. right? So that's the, right. that is the trade off. Like, that's yeah, it, it needs a lot more. It need, a higher percentage of the pie needs to be philanthropic, but the pie needed is smaller, and you can feed a lot more people with that smaller, <laughs> cheaper pie. You know? uh, yeah, yeah thing, you wanted to say something. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The one thing that I would say, and I can say this for from the the writer's perspective. Uh, is that if you want a good investment on something like Jewish journalism or anything else, and I think people on this call can relate, uh, the people doing it need to feel comfortable and secure and not having to like fill out a grant application for every single project they have while worrying if the lights will go off. Right, That has a m number of knock-on effects. Uh, a friend of mine who some of you know, I'm sure Peter is familiar with, uh, Yoni Applebaum, who's the ideas editor at The Atlantic, said you can tell from the culture of a paper which direction of publication, which direction it's going. You walk into the office and you know, right? Are they expanding? Are they excited? Are there things opening up? Are they pursuing all these things? Or are they sort of contracting and just trying to hold the line? And it's like, there are almost only two kinds today, right? There's one or the other. Um, and so that's the sort of thing that I think people don't quite realize. They think, well, I just gave this money for the specific discrete project. You need to create an environment where the journalists can thrive, which right? is where they can feel ambitious. And where they feel like, oh wow, there are there are vistas opening up here, yeah. and I can like try this new thing. But, but Otherwise, by the way, it, it yeah. succeeds. No, so it, that's exactly the same problem that the entire nonprofit sector has, right? Yes. The, the battle between uh, 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 the tug of war between undesignated funds and and, and designated Andre, funds. That tension, that tension, though, in in in, in it, and the one thing about digital is we have the capabilities of if we respond creatively and quickly, the, our ability to massively scale audience and meet radically changing needs like quickly is I think very different than almost any other nonprofit. So for a funder, like if funders come to me and say, well, what's the thing you most need? Like when they have a program, like I'm always gonna say, you wanna invest in our ability to be nimble and flexible. And yeah, you find you like, look at our property, see what we do. You get a sense and we can talk about a direction but why would you buy, like, if you're going to fund digital media, one of the things you're funding is our unprecedented ability to respond in the moment or quickly right. and, and scale up. Like, why would you lock in the funds? It almost doesn't make sense yeah. to, to do it. You're, you're undercutting the main But, but what I think, I think that- to address the bias issue or the, well, how do you deal with the integrity issue of keeping independent from the funders? It's like, if what you're funding is about the long-term sustainability and, and as Ami so 
greatly put it, the ability to do the thing, whatever the thing turns out to be, then that myopic view of like, well, wait, you wrote a nasty story about this fun. It's like, it's small, it's myopic. You know, it's like really about the ability to do this 10 years from now to reach the next generation of Jews. Yeah, and, and I would say, and I would say, just going back to that, to that point, I mean, I think that, I mean, it connects with a question that put in the, in the chat here, which is about sort of donors today think a lot in terms of impact. When you have a specific program, you can, you can see that impact a little bit more clearly than if you, that if you fund general operations. I think that the challenge for us in the, in, in the, both in the philanthropic sector, but also in the journalism space, is to articulate very clearly for funders, what is the impact of our work, not of this particular project, of the entire enterprise of Jewish journalism, and do it in a way that captures the relevance and the urgency of the work, just to borrow verbatim uh, uh, words here. I think that I think that if we manage to do that, we we have a, tr a, a shot of mobilizing support for the sector. Yeah, and, and I and Andres, I would say, and you could, what, what, what when you come when what you can do is you compare that with the numbers that because that's the other thing we have the unprecedented ability to tell you exactly how many people are using this. We can show you right. what they're reading. You know, all that. we have we have the digital media me media metrics give us more texture in just the, more real number snapshot than so, like almost any other you know not for profit entity. And right, what with, and then if you pair that with like a more uh, you know a, a, you know an ability to measure what the impact of all that usage is, then we have a uh, you yeah. know unprecedented. And we're I would say semi based media is in the middle of, of work on that, which we're going to be sharing and I think will be usable, but it's not about, it's not as much about news. And I think that's another, that speaks to another tricky thing is I think, I think there's more appetite in the, in among funders for Jewish media that is about engagement, right? And our ability to show that if you're coming and you're looking at, you know, one of our brands and helping you feel more involved, like there's value in that, but a much trickier and I think harder thing for us to fund is looking at the value of the journalism yeah. and the news and what's the impact of that. Thank you. Thank you all so much. I would love to keep going, but I, I, I need to go now. I mean, you guys can. No, but Andrew, thank you so much for doing but, this. But uh, I would say, I would just say by this, you know, saying in, a, in an unceremonious way, I think that much of the, much of the work we need to do is like, as in, as in the general journalism space, just throwing spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks. It's a time, it's a, it, those are uncharted waters. Like this is a, I actually think this is a time like it was in the 15th century when the printing press was actually invented and changed the nature of communication in a very radical way. And people there, they didn't even know what the impact of the printed book was gonna be. I think we're, we're in some, we're in some, in, in a space like that now, and we need to give ourselves permission to, to try and, and play with different, with different models. But as, while we do that, make, make sure that we keep, that we, that we take care of those institutions and those organizations that uh, if they, if they collapse, it will be very, very hard to bring them back. So I think that we need to play responsibly and take sort of informed risks about the future of the field. And as I said before, you have our commitment to continue this conversation. And I will love to engage with any of you who wants to continue a conversation offline. Thank you all very much. Shabbat Shalom. <laughs>